welcome back to the latest episode of the Be Better podcast. Uh, thank you to our regular listeners, as always, for tuning in. If this is your first time listening, if you have just tuned in to listen to today's guest, Jennifer, or if Jennifer maybe sent you to this podcast, thank you for tuning in. Hopefully you like this one and maybe you'll listen to the back catalogue and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on because they all help. Anyway, enough about that. Um, with me today, I have Jennifer. Is it Bogus? Bogus, yeah. Bogus. Whew, mm-hmm. Should have checked beforehand, but hey, that's how we roll it. Very good. Um, from Hey La La Vanilla. Jennifer, how's it going? It's great, thank you. Yeah. And um, so when, when I always, uh, when I intro the podcast, I, I you know, kia ora, because we're in New Zealand. Shamai is Welsh for hello. In Tongan, we would say... Uh, malo Alele. Malo Alele. There we go. Mm-hmm. Beautiful language, <laughs> beautiful people, beautiful products, as we will find out. Um, so, yeah, Jennifer, just, just for people who don't know you, don't know Hey La La Vanilla, um, who are you and what do you do? Uh, so I'm Jennifer Bogus, the co-founder and CEO of Hey La La Vanilla. Hey La La Vanilla is based in Tauranga in New Zealand, along with Tonga uh, in the South Pacific. So we're a, we're a vanilla company that, um, yeah, I can get into the, to, to the details of um, as we chat through today. But yeah, we started in Tonga um, on the back of an A project and we now, um, that was back in 2002. So we've been on quite a journey. Nice. I, I would say you're anything but a vanilla company, uh, yeah, to be, to be yeah. fair. <laughs> That's what I say to people. There's nothing vanilla about vanilla. About vanilla. <laughs> yeah. it's, how, it's how you do the vanilla. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so what, what do you do with vanilla? Um, you, you make products. Yeah. Tell us just so what, what is it that, that people can, can purchase from your beautiful product line? And how, uh, how is so that we do a it? range of vanilla products, um, obviously the vanilla beans, but that, that's a tiny part of our business. It's our vanilla extracts, vanilla paste, vanilla powders, vanilla sugar. We do a range of seasonal flavored vanillas. Um and we've just launched alcohol-free range of vanillas. They just uh, our alcohol-free paste just won the New Zealand Food Award Supreme Award, won the Pantry mm. Award, along with the Business Innovation Award. Um, vanillas typically extracted in alcohol, so we've worked a way right. to do it um, without alcohol. Uh, so that's yeah, that's exciting. So we sell to um, home bakers, chefs, and food manufacturers. Nice. I, I know for a fact we have some Hey Lala vanilla extracts, um, which my daughter is um, every now and then she'll just go, I feel like baking something and she'll whip up some cookies or a uh, sponge cake or something. So I, I know that we have imbibed um, the beautiful vanilla uh, extract for, for baking it, for the home baker here. Um, I had no idea that, um, yeah, that I was getting boozed while my daughter was making <laughs> So cake. you're only putting in a <laughs> teaspoon. Uh, it's 35 percent alcohol. That's like wow. the FDA um, standards um, for vanilla extract. Um, but obviously it bakes off. Uh, but yep. alcohol free is required in various cultures, um, right. yep. particularly in the Middle East, London. Yep. Um, and yeah, and it's great for applications where you're not baking. So ice creams or smoothies or if you want to use it in your porridge you know and with children and yep. things yeah yeah well there we go I've, I've learned something and we are just a handful of minutes into this episode um that's super <laughs> cool um, and so we, um maybe we'll wait we'll come back into the innovation part of that um mm-hmm. but how, how did you get into selling vanilla um was that the childhood dream of jennifer growing up to be the world <laughs> no it wasn't the childhood sales. dream of jennifer <laughs> I grew up on a dairy farm. My father was quite an entrepreneur on reflection. I didn't really realize it at the time. So he was a dairy farmer, a squash grower, sweet corn grower. Uh, He also built boats and um, he was a keen spear diver. So for his milestone birthday, he wanted to take his boat to Tonga um, and celebrate his birthday and go spear diving. So we all went up there. We didn't go on the boat, we flew, (laughs) Uh, celebrated his milestone birthday and really fell in love with the people in the place of Vava'u in the northern islands of Tonga. And then Dad came back, brought the boat back, and uh, there was a cyclone that went through on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, 2002, and it did a lot of damage. Um, It was really significant, and... Uh, Dad wanted to help a particular family in a village that he'd come to know, so um, he sent them some money to repair their roof, and then he realised the damage was a lot more extensive, so he went back with a group of his 
uh, Rotary mates and they did a whole lot of rebuilding work. And after that, um, the head of the village said to him, you know, as a farmer, uh, John, what can you, what could we grow here that would provide, you know, employment for my family and community? Mm -hmm. So dad, being the farmer that he was, looked around, vanilla had grown there in the past. He went on a worldwide vanilla journey to Madagascar, Reunion Island, Costa Rica, Tahiti, planted vanilla. And in 2005, he handed me the first crop, which was about 45 kilos and said, um, you know, we've started something here. We're going to have to keep it going for these people. And uh, I was an accountant at the time. I was a bit bored with life. And I took it back to some chefs in New Zealand and showed them and they said it was the best vanilla they'd ever seen. So that was sort of the start of the journey. Um, I didn't leave my day job until 2008. So, um, yeah. Well, that's a <laughs> such a typical <laughs> backstory. Um, <laughs> quite a bit to unpack there. Um, mm. Yeah, that's that's not the typical kind of startup business journey of I've got a I've got a bit of an idea, you know, I'll go and give it a no. go. Um, maybe see what happens. That, I mean that that's been we've done quite a few episodes recently and, and there, there seems to be a bit of a theme of I kind of had an idea, I gave it a go. Um, but this is um I guess, you know, from the from the B Corp impact lens kind of thing, it it's really coming from from like a the heart yeah. and soul of look, we 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 want you to come and help us. And, and there's a there's a there's a real need here rather than you know, I always sort of say in the startup world, quite often it's like, oh yeah, it's another drone delivered pizza idea. It's like, yeah, yeah, do we do we really need it? It's kind of like, yeah, it's a, maybe a nice to have on a, you know, on a fun day. Um, but yeah, actually helping economic development and therefore community development in a place that's just been ravaged through a natural disaster, that's pretty meaningful stuff. Um, mm. Sounds yeah, like so my yeah, my dad did that initial rebuilding project, and then um, him and his group of mates have done one every year right up until 2019 was the last one, obviously because of COVID. Yeah. Um, and Hey La La Vanilla also during that time was involved in those projects and, um, you know, established the Hey La La Vanilla Foundation to, to make it more um, formalised and structured and transparent, I suppose. So, yeah, we've always been focused on doing good we call ourselves the good vanilla because um of yeah that the, the the place where we came from and we're we and it still holds super true and you know guides us today mm. and and hey lala does that have a, a meaning hey lala is the national flower of tonga uh, they have the annual hey lala festival it's a little white flower that turns a pinky red when you dip it in salt water uh, so it's got lots of myths and legends. Um, it's used in beautiful lays. Um, and it's also the name of one of the daughters of um, the village leader that said to my father, um, you yeah. know, what can you do? So it's sort of, uh, you know, when I brought those first vanilla beans back, I thought, what what can we call them? I can't just say these are Tongan vanilla beans. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it was, oh, hey, Lala, I really like that word. I like what it stands for. So. Mm. Hmm. It's it, it just sounds it's really upbeat and positive it's like the, um there's a town in uh north uh, sort of northeast usa i think it's it's uh i can't remember what state it, it might be oh it's northeast it's called kalamazoo and it's like now how can you be upset living in the town called kalamazoo it's just <laughs> it's such an upbeat happy name and i think hey lala just it, it's upbeat it's happy it just kind of cap and it captures the essence vague pun intended of of everything you're trying to do yeah because i think yeah it, it's inter- it's really is interesting look i i, I did um this workshop I did with a friend yesterday, I, I can't name his company name yet because he's just starting out and he's he's like, well, I, I don't want to put the name out there, but the name of his company, just like, it's such a great name, which encapsulates everything that he does. And it's like, man, that's genius. And yeah, the B Corp community seems to be quite full of, of well-named companies that describe, mm. you know, the, the impact and, and the connection to what they're doing. So yeah, I don't know whether it's, whether we are attracted to it because we're a certain type of person that likes sort of doing good. I don't know. Maybe that's a, <laughs> a project for an MBA student or a, a postgrad somewhere. Um, so, so, so accounting, yeah, g- getting into accounting, you know, was, was purpose doing good uh, like on your radar uh, growing up or w- were you just kind of like 
I'm going to go and try and be an accountant, get a job in accountant and count lots of numbers for the rest of my life. And I'll be pretty happy. Um, no, I did, you know, I was good at it at school, went to uni, did an accounting and marketing degree. Accounting jobs were easy to get after uni. So kind of fell into it, really. Mm. And then when I was, um, you know, right up until I had children, I was doing accounting and then when I had two young daughters I was a part-time accountant um so you know in 2000s when um my father was taking his boat to Tonga uh, I was doing a bit of soul searching and I was just like accounting and I was an accountant for a trucking and a forestry um like a trucking company that worked in the forestry industry so it wasn't kind of really floating my boat or mm. <laughs> inspiring me. Uh, so I wanted to do something more purpose-driven and I was doing, yeah, lots of soul-searching, as I say. But then, obviously, my father handing me, you know, those first vanilla beans was a bit of a pivotal moment. Mm. Uh, and I thought, wow, purpose has found me. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it, it didn't happen straight away. I um, We went on a, a family road trip, my husband and I and two daughters in the States in 2007. And I looked at vanilla on the shelves in some, you know, food stores. And I thought, oh, they look like boring brown medicine bottles to me. Mm. They're kind of this sea of brown and beige. And I thought we can do something so much more exciting and vibrant. And uh, that that was really, yeah, then I ca we came back from that trip and um, my husband has a background in IT and technology, so he was sort of the, the R&D arm. Um, my father was obviously growing vanilla and then I was like, okay, well, I've got to sell it. So, um, yeah, that that's how it sort of started. And so I remember sitting down at my desk in 2008 in January thinking, well, what's the worst that can happen? You know, if it doesn't work out, then I'll just go and get a job as an accountant again. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it worked out. Nice. Yeah. It's, um, are, are you, do you know the brand Dr. Peppers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, it's, it's not a common brand in New Zealand, I don't think. So, no. The, their, yeah. their tagline was, you know, try it. What's the worst that could happen? But, you know, you might <laughs> like it better than Coke. So I, I love that phrase because <laughs> I've used it a few times in workshops and, and go, you know, it's like a Dr. Peppers moment. People just go, I don't know what you're on about, mate. <laughs> so thank you for the cultural reference and, and, and having that one. Um, so you, you had this bag bag of vanilla. Um, did you just what you you went to the like a uh, I don't know? Did you go to the Rotary and say, hey, does anyone is anyone anyone making a, a cake? Do you want some vanilla? Or did you like how did you, or did you go down to the local restaurants and super you know? So hey, um... do you want some, like, how did you? <laughs> sell the first work out batch. what to do with it yeah. well th yeah those first vanilla beans we took to some chefs to try it and at that stage we weren't even thinking that far ahead we just thought oh we'll just sell you know we'll just grow vanilla beans and sell vanilla beans but then you realize it's such a tiny little market vanilla beans um and once you look at that baking category you realize there's vanilla extracts vanilla um, our pace was very innovative um, so we had to do some R&D partnered with Massey University in New Zealand um, it's not like you can kind of dial up on the internet how to make vanilla extract well you couldn't back in 2006 7 8 uh, and we did a project with Massey uh, and started making vanilla extracts so and then I just looked I we went to some really sort of high-end chefs in New Zealand, then went to some specialty retailers. Um, for those that are in Auckland, Faro Fresh was one of our first customers. Um, and then we just sort of found our way, really. And then so in New Zealand, once we had some chefs and we had some specialty retailers, uh, then we went across the ditch to, to Australia and did the similar there in each state. It was basically a different market. Uh, and then, yeah, we just we just grew from there, really listened to customers, market trends, um, spent a lot of time, you know, in market. And in the U.S. is like the home of vanilla. There's this book, I think, part of the reason why my father fell in love with vanilla, because um, he says, you know, once once you're into vanilla, you're kind of like hooked because it's this whole mystic you know, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of romance, there's a bit of, you know, wars. <laughs> it's quite a um, nothing vanilla about vanilla. So there's been this book called The Vanilla, or uh, The Ice Cream Orchid, it's called. Um, and it's all about vanilla, its history and everything. But yeah, and 
is the US market is really the home of vanilla. It's um, one of the presidents, I think it was Jefferson, kind of invented vanilla ice cream. Um, and as Americans have great baking season from Halloween through to, you know, Christmas, January, um, there's lots of baking in the home. They understand what real vanilla is. There's labeling and FDA regulations about vanilla. So we knew pretty early on that if we were going to be serious in the vanilla world, you know, we had to really be in that US market. So yeah, I just, I just spent a lot of time in market and research. And yeah, it's amazing what you can pick up and network with people. <laughs> mm. 100%. Yeah, there's, um, do you know Perry Drysdale? from yeah. Untouched World. We had mm. her on the podcast, I think it was last week. Um, sort of similar kind of story. Um, she had a couple of young kids. She started making these mittens with some sort of leftover wool and then went down to some local markets in Christchurch um, and sold them. And then one one lady in one of the shops sort of said, look, you you, you need to sell these at a higher price and, and call them handmade premium wool. Um, and then she did. And then she sold more of them. And then her, her and her husband moved to the States uh, for her, for his work. And then she just went in and started selling them in, in the US. And that was kind of like the beginning of the. And I think it's for anyone who's starting a business, it's like, just go and hit the streets. Keep shaking yeah. hands. Say yeah. good day. Hey, we also did. Thing. You know, we also let, did let know. farm farmers markets in the yeah. beginning yeah yeah mm. I'm, I'm really intrigued about this history of vanilla and vanilla wars um tell me about that um so vanilla was in kind of i don't know not invented but it was first grown and discovered in mexico in the 1800s and it was used um along with cacao for royalty as like drinks and uh perfume vanilla was um in its raw form and then from there, it was taken to England, um, you know, again, for royalty. And then um, it was somehow put in a, um, you know, in a, a glass house in, in England, and it was transported to Reunion Island. Um, but it was another 120 years until it was discovered how to actually and to pollinate vanilla, mm. because in Mexico, there's a bee that pollinates right. vanilla. Uh, outside of Mexico, there's no bee. So uh, it took 120 years to discover that you had to hand pollinate uh, vanilla for a vanilla bean to grow. Mm -hmm. So again, it's quite sort of magical. The flower opens, it has to be hand pollinated within four hours, otherwise it dies. Nine months later, later like a baby, so they call it the love bean, um, you get a green vanilla bean that's mature and mm -hmm. then you have to pick it uh, and ferment it uh, and cure it over three months. So it's really like 12 months from that mm. flower being pollinated to having a, a mature um, aromatic vanilla bean that's that's ready um, for consumption. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the vanilla is grown 20 degrees either side of the equator, so it's in that, you know, narrow ring mm. around the globe. Um, and I think just based on some of those countries where it's located, uh, it's been, you know, used and traded in some in history like gold almost. Um, its price fluctuates back in 2013, 14. I think it got to the same price as silver per kilo. Right. So um, it's come off, you know, from that. But yeah, it's just again, it's nothing vanilla about vanilla. <laughs> no, and so I guess it's like a commodity. Yeah, if it's being traded for royalty, then. So yeah, what wars fought around? Uh, I guess yeah. getting mm. getting getting hold of the vanilla. It's one because you just, I guess, um, it's it's flavor um, that you just imagine has always been here. You, you don't mm -hmm. think that it's it's actually that recent. Um, but I guess yeah, like most you know, salt and pepper, you know, or or any of those sort of spices or um, extracts. It's yeah, it's it it was kind of discovered. Yeah, yeah they they call like salt like similar to salt vanilla is the underwear of baking they say you know if it's <laughs> if it's not there but you don't know if it's there and it's similar to salt right you know if something yeah, yeah. Not, if there's no salt but you don't necessarily know that it's in there mm. that's also i think that might just be the title <laughs> for this podcast the underwear of baking <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's super cool. And so 
so bringing it to Tonga, um, how, how did people react to that? Um, because I guess it's it's a, it's a non-native, um, you know, species or, or, or variety that, that you're taking somewhere. Um, was that a consideration or, were, you know, is Tonga or does Tonga already have other, you know, varieties of, of, of plant and, and food that I guess typically Western importations of, of stuff that's probably been been taken there by various missionaries over the years before mm. that. But was was there any consideration around that or, or were they like, yeah, look, this just sounds great? Uh, no, there was consideration because so it had been based in Vava'u in the Northern Islands of Tonga where my dad was thinking, what can I grow to provide employment for these people? Uh, it had to be something that wasn't perishable because there was no reliable freight, you know, and if, it, and if it was to be exported and not just for the local market to be sort of a sustainable employment model. Um, so he looked at various things. Uh, limes, I think, was one thing he looked at. And um, but vanilla had grown there in the 70s and the 80s um, from an American company that kind of went in and went out again pretty quickly. And um, so, you know, he knew that it could grow there and there was some abandoned vanilla um, farms. So he was able to get uh, cuttings and set up that first farm on um, the Latu's family's um, land. So in Tonga, you can't own, you can't buy or sell land. You can lease land. Um, and as each um, eldest son from each family, you know, has an allotment. Um, so yeah, we that first partnership was with the Latu family on their allotment, um, which is still there today. Yeah. So the land is owned by the is it the, by the Latu Tonga? family and, and we lease it from oh them. right so yeah so as, a, as yeah. a foreigner you can't own any land yeah right yeah. right yeah um cool and then of now you know we've got sort of 300 we've got up to 300 growers across multiple islands in Tonga that we work with um and then in addition we also have um two 50 acre plantations um that we've developed in partnership with a family up there uh, that is land owned by the king, that he gave us the right to occupy that land on the basis of providing employment and economic development for the, for the island. Nice, super cool. And so that it, it was all well received because, because you know, there, I, I guess there's oftentimes this, the concept that, you know, oh, it's, it's the Western saviour coming in, you know, oh, yeah, and, and I guess, um, there are sometimes when it has you know it is done really badly there's been mm -hmm. lack of consideration for local culture and ownership and what have mm -hmm. you um yeah was that, did you do anything particularly around that or, or were you just empathetic and, and following the lead of, of of the family that were, like how, how was there anything yeah specific around how, and were you nervous about you know hey look it's you know these kiwis coming over telling you how to how to run your run your show yeah i think my dad is quite a special person if I do say so myself um, and obviously you know he was doing those aid projects every year so we had alongside this vanilla plantation for the Latu family so he had a lot of respect from the locals and a lot of relationships that he built with people um, so they knew that he was do, wanting to do this from a place of helping them it wasn't um, you know he was 60 plus he wasn't there you know to build this big business empire or anything he was there to genuinely help communities um and everybody <laughs> in Vivao is quite wary of the Palangi um the the European because they've seen people come in and out um you know as I say now that some kind of 20 years later um you know you see people come in and out flash the cash turn up a year later, expect something to be um, as it was when they left a year ago, um, and it's just not the case. Mm. So we're very fortunate that we have really strong relationships that we've built with um, both our partner families that we work with and smallholder farmers. Um, so, you know, we're all about taking Tonga's vanilla to the world um, in partnership with them. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, rather than because I guess the 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 risk is 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 exploitation, isn't it? It's like hey, you, you kind of don't know the good thing that you've got, but you know, 
that's okay. We, we, we'll help you take it to the world. And actually, you know, we're doing really, really well and, and you're getting nothing. But having worked with you on your B Corp, I know that that's not the case uh, because of how you're how you're running it, um, mm. which is, yeah, it's super cool. Um, so how did you, so yeah, in terms of like baking, because I think it's fair to say you had the impact really, you know, solidly baked in before you went on the B Corp journey. So the B Corp really was proof, you know, c- cementing, and, and mm-hmm. possibly just lemon squeezing a couple of bits of of what you were already doing. So you, you've got the foundation, you've got, um, you know, you've got employees over there. Um, how did you go about structuring it in, in a way so that it was a partnership so that the, you know, the Tongan side of the entity, you know, was involved and was, was I guess, treated equitably? Like, because I'm guessing you, you haven't set up a, a global a vanilla business whilst you were an accountant and, no, your dad no. was busy being a farmer. So, <laughs> how did you navigate that process? Um, um, and any any tips or tricks? Gosh, I'm trying to think back. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, big... we had we had a separate, um, you know, a Tongan company. Um, we had a New Zealand company, um, but uh, common shareholding between both. Um, I'm just. I mean, we really involved the Latu family right from the beginning because, yeah, they're, they're there, they're, um, you know, and and really let them sort of lead it in a way um, because, like you mentioned before, and my dad has always said this, he said, you know, there's nothing worth, they're not going to respect you if you just turn up once every six months and say, you know, do it this way or the highway kind of thing. So it was a real partnership. Um, my dad spent a lot of time there, um, working a lot, you know, he's a farmer talking to farmers as well. I think it's a different, that, that also, that situation is unique. Um, and we also work really closely with an NGO in Tonga called Mordi and have right from the early days, um, which stands for, um, M-O-R-D-I is Mainstreaming of Rural Development and Innovation. And they're all about empower, empowering rural farming communities. So we're very much aligned um, and work closely with them. So, you know, at a at a village and a farmer level, we've kind of got that relationship that, you know, it cements a, an element of respect mm-hmm. Um yeah, but it's something we all, you know, continually work on. Uh, also, His Majesty um, giving us the right to occupy his land was another sort of, um, you know, is that additional level of respect as well in the local community. Um, and then setting up the Vanilla, Heilala Vanilla Foundation, which um, we did back in 2013 and did various sort of ad hoc projects. But back in January 2020, 22 uh when there was the big natural disaster of the eruption and the tsunami Mm. um we did a fundraising uh with our um, international community and raised 180,000 and then from then we did five cents per unit so now we have a much more formalized um and transparent impact uh model that you know we have it's it's run separately it's got separate governance it has Tongan trustees from um various um you know stakeholders in Tonga so it feels very connected yeah and collaborative mm. yeah I think I think yeah that that was a word I was gonna say it's it's collaborative it's partnership it's and, and I think the peer you know peer to peer it's it's um mm-hmm. you know I think that, that that's really sort of like genius of you know yeah, your dad understands farming. We understand farming. We, we we just we understand different parts of farming. If we put the two together, you know, uh, y- your dad could bring in the external idea um, and some systems and processes, maybe uh, and thoughts. But hey, we we've got this tradition. We know what we're doing. We understand the land. We understand you know the cycles, the seasons, what have you. And I think it's it's interesting because obviously um, within the New Zealand context. Uh, Teo Māori principles of business, um, you know, long-term thinking, partnership, collaboration, uh, you know, think about people and planet, um, lots of overlaps with B Corp. Um, mm. 
did, did you having been through the B Corp journey? Did, did you get a sense that is is that how business or how how the farmers you were working with in Tonga do they work to similar principles of you know long term thinking? Um, yeah, is there um, any no. Sort of overlap there? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're very um, because their crops outside of vanilla. Um, I think what we've been able to provide is some um, encouragement and support for growing vanilla because typically they grow crops that are like cash crops, three months, taro, yam, mm. um, bananas, things that they can sell on the local market and there's a quick cash payback um, to support their families. Where And then there's kava, which has a similar... Um, more long-term horizon but it's something that they use in their culture so they can understand it and relate to it a bit more whereas mm -hmm. vanilla is this they don't use it in their culture um right. and it's a really long-term thing like you plant a cutting you've got to plant a host tree for that cutting uh four years later if you're lucky you'll get your first flower and then a year later you're going to get a vanilla bean so it's a really long horizon so typically it's grown alongside all those other crops mm. so that the farmer has a balance of you know long-term and short-term income mm. and you know it provides more sort of resilience I think um when they've got you know other crops as well yeah. uh so yeah no that the vanilla and having us there growing we you know we started growing vanilla on that one uh, allotment of land yeah that's sort of provided um encouragement and a level of security because they know that we're there every year we're not mm. like a palangi that's turned up in the past and comes back next year but then they never see them again so you know we've been very consistent uh and supportive right through the the journey and will continue to be nice no one's thought about taking the bee from mexico and bringing the bee i, I guess no, that's... i don't know even in mexico now they hand pollinate it because they don't right. think the bee's reliable enough right so it's naughty yeah. bees mm. <laughs> that'd be you know for a bee corp you could you could yeah it could be a, could be a sideline bee business yeah of, of bees, bee importation but i suppose that's got a whole there's other... not many bees in tonga at all because when my father was thinking about crops like avocados or something right. um yeah there was no bees hmm. interesting you just don't you just don't you don't think about how many yeah. years. I mean, I suppose increasingly we, we're being told and, and the whole, you know, take your car for a drive and how many bits of bugs hit the windscreen. Does It does seem to be less and less every year. Mm. Um, but yeah, you don't, you don't sort of think about, oh, how many bees are there? <laughs> and I suppose, yeah, tropical island, uh, lots of wind, uh, small piece of land, mm. chances of bee finding it or getting there is, is pretty low, I suppose. Um, so yeah, tell, tell us a bit more about um, the impact that you've got baked in. So, because you, you've got the, the business in Tonga, you've got the foundation providing support. Um, yeah, talk, talk, to me, talk to me about how you're making an impact on the ground. What's the sort of mm -hmm. the good, that, good that you're doing? Um, so really our impact's kind of divided into two areas. One is in the area of vanilla farming. So we measure um, like volume of vanilla, um, training, um, at the moment, we're doing um, uh, like a regenerative soil um, trial where we've planted a, an area on our farm of uh, like a macuna bean that um, we then um, monitor. And then if we get the right results, we share those macuna bean seeds with other farmers. So um, this kind of the vanilla farming impact side where we want to build a really robust um you know and strong vanilla industry for Tonga uh then the other side is really around community development so it's in community vanilla you know rural communities uh centers around um family well-being so we do one-off projects for families that um we find out about through being on the ground or through our team finding out there. Um, we've done things like an outboard motor for a family on an outer island. Um, we did a sewing machine and an overlocker for two young girls that wanted to set up their own sewing clothing business. Um, uh, we've recently just uh, fenced um, a, a property for a widow, a lady that was recently widowed and she wanted to grow vegetables and flowers to sell on the local market. Um, and that was a way of of supporting her was to fence her property so that she, um, for the you know animals, mm -hmm. pigs and things not trampling it and damaging the plants. Um, 
So yeah, that community development is centered around uh, an impact centered around family well-being, education, something that's really close to our heart. Um, so we've done quite a few uh, school support projects, you know, whether it's desks and chairs, equipment, um, and other resources. Um, and then, oh gosh, I'm having a mind blank. The third one, <laughs> there's three areas under community. Yeah, so it's family well-being and education. Gosh, I'm gonna have to have a mind blank about that. <laughs> I'm just I'm just in the process of writing our annual impact report. So we publish it, we've published an annual impact report since 2020, mm -hmm. um, where we outline all our mm -hmm. um our impact. Um and oh the other one's emergency relief. So we allocate um funding every year for emergency um, relief. Obviously, last year we had the, the huge disaster. Um, we also had COVID that we provided like COVID care kits um, to communities that were feeling very uh, isolated. Um, and, you know, there's been various cyclones and things and we've provided uh, whatever support is recognised as needed um, that's not being met by some of the other support agencies. Uh, one year we did 30 chainsaws to farmers um, on one island that were particularly um, badly damaged and needed to clear their um, farms. Mm. Um, so, yeah, those are the... Plenty, plenty yeah. going on. Yes. <laughs> nice. So, um, yeah, and the foundation, like I said, we have five trustees, so um, three of those are Tongan um and myself and my father so um yeah we've got lots to focus on mm. your father must be feeling pretty proud with what you've achieved it, 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 it's, it's almost like you know here's a hospital pass hey here's some vanilla go do something with it and <laughs> you know yeah I was you know he's eight, he's 82 now and I just talked to him this morning he's up in Tonga at the moment up in Favau at the mm. moment um and you know it's it's as much as it's his passion really is mm. um, and continues to be. So um, my mother thinks he's crazy and she's like, do you think he's still going to be there when he's 90? I'm like, probably. More than likely by the day. sounds of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, there's worse places to have to go and hang out, you know, <laughs> with your crazy husband. <laughs> oh no, go to Tonga again. Oh, what a, what a drag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know as he's he's aged and he's got younger my mother's age she's got older so she doesn't go to Tonga anymore so right. yeah oh right so there's a bit of a <laughs> yeah uh, it's a shame um so you you you've lots of baking puns intended you've baked in all this impact you know from day one um when when so when did B Corp pop on the radar as and and what and why the interest in in B Corp because you you were kind of you know you're you're like I say you're atypical in many ways uh, of all the companies we work with most of them are starting their journey to work out how do we do more good and you know b corp's a framework to have a think about that and not many companies unlock an impact business model like you did or i think you unlock more than one impact business model. I think I we unlock three governance yeah. community and environment yeah yeah mm -hmm. so you know and, and you were already doing that and you had been doing that pretty much from day one so that's that's quite special you know because most other companies are just aren't doing that so yeah, what why why B Corp and when when did it pop up on the on the radar? Um so it popped up on my radar, I think. I was trying to have a think about this. In 2013, I was at the US on a at a a trade show. Like they have this annual big uh food show called Expo West for mm -hmm. all natural specialty, not just food actually, but anything, natural consumer products basically. So it's um and B Corp had a stand there and they must have had a couple of food brands that were B Corp on their stand uh, and I just remember looking at it and thinking wow that is cool like and that's kind of who we are so I always kind of had it in the back of my mind but I didn't you know we weren't a big business at all I mean I still don't think we're you know we're a small SME today but um, back then we were a lot smaller and we weren't really in the US as such um, so I kind of always parked it in the back of my mind um, and then I think it wasn't until it was about 2019 and that sort of came up on the in the New Zealand Australian landscape you begin to hear about it a bit more um, and we thought 
it's just something that really resonated with us. So we had a look at it and realized that naturally, like you mentioned, we sort of just, you know, it, it seemed like it was a real natural fit for us. And there's so many, uh, we'd looked at other certifications in our journey, like organic, fair trade. Oh, there's so many you can do. Um, but B Corp felt like the one that was a natural fit for us. And, and to me, it sort of encompassed a whole lot of other things as well. It wasn't just on one specific area. So to me, B Corp covers fair trade. Uh, it covers organics to some extent because you're not harming the planet and doing what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, it was a natural fit, I think. Um, and we did that. I remember doing that initial, like, um, you know, on the B Corp website and going through and answering the questions and to see what score we would get in that sort of initial draft assessment. Uh, and I think we were at 90 something, but, you know, we didn't really think too much about a lot of the questions. Obviously, when we then worked with you and realized that there was other things that we hadn't even thought about, like you said, squeeze the lemon a bit more um, yeah, and, and unlock some a couple of things, further things and um, yeah, got ended up where we were through the process. But um, yeah, to to us, it's just a natural extension of who we are. Yeah. So we didn't really have to change anything. <laughs> no. Um, which is, you know, that's cool. You know, it just, it, for me, you know, B Corp was in some ways almost made for a business like yours. It's like, you know, this, this is, we, we've been doing all this stuff. This is now the independent verification to prove that mm. all the claims we've been telling you are actually true and we we are now benchmarked against a global framework to, to demonstrate yeah you know, which is awesome do you, do you remember what your final score was it was uh it's 104.7 yeah. mm. which you know is a really good score you know it's proof that you've got you, you typically you, you don't get over the hundred unless you've got impact business models so you know just genuine proof that the work you're doing is is good so um yeah, was it? Were there any surprises or um, yeah, anything unexpected um, as you went through the assessment? Any any parts of the business that you that you've maybe gone? Oh, hang on, we haven't really looked at that one before. Or um, oh, hang on, we we possibly need. It to was be probably the the environment area that we weren't that. Um, what's the word? Um, structured around in terms of um, you know, capturing water usage, power use, you know, those sorts of environmental um that yeah, that that was probably what I felt was our weakest section and it but you know then we became uh then we realized working with you that, you know, we have a zero waste process, um, which is patented. So um you know that it got added you know, and that submission review you know in the review phase before we submitted for certification uh but and that's the section that i think we've got the most room to improve and grow on which you know i'm quite excited about in terms of um the way the world's going in terms of you know carbon sequestration possibilities that we can do with vanilla um you know i have a i have a personal mission to, <laughs> to be the first carbon positive um vanilla company in the world um so yeah there's there's lots of exciting things i think that we can do in that environment space um obviously looking at the new standards and how that fits into that but yeah nice yeah it's um it's a great tool to verify the good that you're doing but it's an impact guide to, to mm -hmm. shine a light on okay where can we be better which we you know which is why we call out our, our program the be better program you know use b corp to become a better business um, mm. and it's it's a moving feast you know there's and there's going to be you know like you say that the new assessment's going to be coming out i think it's 2025 it's looking like now it's going to be be launched oh, okay. um which is when we're up for recertification so i don't know yeah <laughs> it's it's, it's the 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 rumor we're hearing on the grapevine is that it's m most likely that you would still be able to certify under the current system for your next recertification oh, because okay. they recognize that companies that have kind of built their business, like, you know, mine is an example. I've built my business since 2016 around this framework and mm -hmm. it's going to take me a while to, to, change. to change my business to meet the new standard. So my understanding is there's going to be a, like a grace period potentially of at least one recertification cycle to give you time to 
align yeah. to the new standards but don't quote mm-hmm. me on that um, but that's the okay. rumor that i've heard mm-hmm. um yeah so yeah it's, it's an impact guide to just to, to let you know you know think about where where you could do do more good um and so what does being a b corp mean to you uh like you mentioned i think it's real validation of our purpose um and of being you know the good vanilla um Part of a global community, it feels, you know, really good to be part of that community, um, especially when you read about other B Corps uh, and you think, yeah, we're in the, you know, we're in this, we're, we're all in this together to make the world a better place. So it feels part of, it feels great to be part of something bigger um, and, you know, a bigger movement. Uh, so, yeah, I feel really proud and the business feels really proud to be, you know, a B Corp um so yeah those are the two sort of key things really nice yeah yeah i think that's echoed by most people um Mm. that sort of center community um yeah um have you got jamie oliver using your vanilla yet his his company's oh is it yeah the jamie oliver group is a b corp so maybe uh yeah maybe (laughs) see if we can come on come on internet we, we've I see he's there. in Sydney at the moment, actually. Oh, well, okay. Have you got any anyone in the team in Sydney <laughs> yeah. or, or a, a, a good mate over there who you could, you know, go and uh, try and find the hotel he's in and just yeah. you know, put a big tub of vanilla? <laughs> I'm, this is, I'm sure that this is the internet. We've put it out there now. It's in the ether it's world. Gonna, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, you, you, so you, you're now... Um, running a B Corp, but you've 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 been an impact driven business for you know since day one. So, how have you managed to balance purpose and profit? Because there is there is always this tension to you know take the money or do the good, and you need the money to do the good. And mm. sometimes you've got to take slightly dirtier money to enable yourself to keep going so that you can do more good ultimately. Um, not that I'm suggesting you, you you've got dirty, but you know what I mean? So sometimes we have to do things that are less impactful or um, less aligned with with how we'd want to do it uh, because you've got to keep the lights on and, and you've got a team and, and you know, you're a growing company. So yeah, any any sort of stories or, or, or anecdotes or, or have you got a theory as to how you approach that um, making tough decisions? Um, well, I think we're very fortunate because from day one, we were, you know, a purpose-driven business. Um, so when we went, you know, vanilla, a vanilla business is a very um, cash, it's a real long-term cash cycle, as I outlined before. So you have a real, as you're growing, you have a real requirement for working capital. So we've we've done two capital raises. And uh, when you're pitching your business for capital, um, you you know, you're pitching your story and alongside that you're pitching your growth journey and where you think you can take the business. So the shareholders that came on, you know, that are involved in Hey La La Vanilla, they're all very aligned around our purpose and that's when you ask them, you know, why did they invest? The the key thing really is that they're really aligned with the doing good. Um, so I feel incredibly fortunate that, we have, you know, that that group of shareholders. Um, we also have a board of directors um, representing those shareholders, um, and they're also very aligned. But you know, on the flip side, like you said, we're a growing business. We have um, KPIs um, and you know aspirations um, to grow. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> but. At the same time, we're really aligned around the purpose. And I think having the foundation um, as a structure, um, we have, you know, that line on our P&L of five cents every unit. So um, so every month you see what's going to the foundation. I think that level of kind of transparency and also having that structure, so it's almost like it's a non-negotiable kind of line on our P&L. Um, it just... You know, I we've never really had, I, I can't really remember any sort of challenging conversations about, you know, tension conversations about, about that um, purpose and profit. Um, because to me, the purpose and the impact never feels like it's at the expense of, of profit. Because even if you have a bad financial year, um, it's not like you can say it's because 
you know, we did this impact or we, you know, we spent this money here. It's it's usually related to much bigger things um, that are, are very business related. So I feel like if the business is, and the model that we've set up now with the five cents per unit, you know, like if the business grows and we keep selling more vanilla and new markets and customers, then obviously the impact's going to grow as well. So it's just like a a really circular model that that works for us, um, which I, you know, I feel very grateful for because really at the heart of me is, you know, my personal why is about, you know, making a difference in people's lives. So, um, yeah, that's, I'm fortunate to have people around me that are also aligned on that. Nice. Yeah, mm. that's, um, I, I think you need to reflect on how rare that is um, because we, we're definitely seeing more broadly that in governance, a lot a lot of governance people don't understand the impact side of it, you know, because traditional director trading is, you know, shareholder primacy, maximize financial return. Yes, there's increasing consideration about environmental issues, but yeah, fundamentally, the ESG thing. yeah, mm. fundamentally, it's still, you know, the the driver is is the shareholder primacy. What's the return? And again, what you, what you've done is what I think every B Corp should be aspiring to is index the impact to the revenue. You know, so so you scale, you make more good. Um, and and as you said, your your business, the impact you're making is not reliant on on sort of external factors but if you have a bad year you're you're still making a a proportionate amount of impact um Mm -hmm. as opposed to oh well we had a really good year this year we'll donate some money to charity uh but we had a bad year this year uh okay we can't Mm -hmm. afford to do it and so it's kind of disconnected and lumpy but also you know above and beyond you know the, the the charitable contribution is is almost like the bonus because you've also just got the core good that you're doing by employing people on good wages providing opportunity hope meaning jobs uh, you know all mm. the rest of it which is which is the the day-to-day so it's you, you're, yeah you're, you're like a bonus mm. component um uh, of the charitable side of things almost so yeah no i think you're you, you're a great example of a of just an awesome b corp do, doing good you know at every level of the business um and, and i'd put you up there you know with, with the top of them like like the atiques you know it's it's like everything that you do is just it's just good it's i think you're the way I always look at it is if you look at the business, how how easy is it to criticize the business for not doing stuff? And I look at you, I look at Atik and, and a few others and you go, it's really hard to kind of go, yeah, but you're not doing this because you're doing so much good and, and it's baked in. So I think you, you need to you need to know that because I think quite often people like yourself running these businesses, you, you're like the fish in water. You, you don't recognize that, <laughs> you know, you, you're just doing it because you've always done it that way because that's how you how you set it up. Um, because you're a great human and so yeah w- what you're doing is genuinely next level so go you um you. You, you you mentioned innovation a couple of times so th- it, does that uh, sort of entrepreneurial spirit i mean entrepreneurial spirit and accounting aren't sort of typically <laughs> I, people who know me well know that i typically pick on accountants and marketing people i pick on accountants <laughs> because i don't understand numbers so that's purely a, a projection of my inability to do numbers and that is all thanks to mrs dalrymple who was my math teacher when i was about seven who said i was an idiot because i couldn't understand what she was teaching me so i was like cool okay well i'll stop learning i use mindset um, and i pick on marketing people because um, i'm a reformed sales guy and we always pick on marketing people because they just shouted us about the pantone color that we haven't used on a spreadsheet or uh, sorry on a, on a powerpoint presentation so um yes yeah, so, so you've got the entrepreneurial spirit from from your dad um but yeah the, the innovation stuff that you've been doing so you, like you said you've got the zero waste you've got the alcohol free vanilla is that driven by you um or wh- where does that come from and and um, how do you build that into a company well <laughs> right from the beginning you know we're like we just didn't want to be another vanilla company um and so you know, right at the beginning, we did vanilla paste, which there wasn't very many vanilla pastes around, um, and we and we did it in a really innovative way. Other pastes were like fifty percent sugar in our paste, and it was the first ingredient. Our paste is five percent sugar; it's the last ingredient. Um, my, I have to give a lot of credit to my husband, uh, who is, you know, as I mentioned before, got a technology background, so he's really sort of become the R and D arm of the business. Um, but our our innovation and really is driven by um, 
you know, marketing um, and looking what's in market and other categories outside of vanilla. Vanilla is such a tiny little category mm. in the supermarket. Um, so often it's really challenging to get uh, ranging and shelf space. Uh, so we look into other categories and see what's happening there, look at packaging. I think our um, branding and packaging really stands out on shelf. Um, I'm incredibly proud of that. I'm very fortunate to have uh, a team of people around me that in our sort of management team, in our management team that um, have joined the business over the years uh, that have, have brought a lot of those skills and um, knowledge and energy uh, and momentum into the business um, and that you know that from a business perspective that's you know a, a key learning is you know you can't do it all on your own and um, yeah you, it's really incredibly important to have a team of people around you that are, are all working for the same thing um, so yeah we like I said we don't want to be just another boring brown vanilla company <laughs> so um, uh, that's I think yeah. yeah, you're clearly uh, anything but that. So, have you have you found um, you know what one of the benefits of B Corp, according to the the data, is you know uh, better staff attraction and retention. Have have you found that people have wanted? I mean, but again, I think it's hard for you to maybe separate because you've been built as a B Corp since day one. But have you found you know people attracted to coming to work for the company because yeah. of the good that you're, that's that's yeah. I think oh. when we when you know when we we've grow we grew the team quite a lot over those COVID years because everybody was home baking um and and interviews and things you know you say you know why do you want to come and work for Hey La La Vanilla and every time it's because of the business what you stand for who you are your purpose um your story uh those yeah those sorts of things so um and yeah, we have a, a number of our team are really, you know, they've 10 plus years. So they've they've been on the journey with us. Um, they're part of the, the Hey La La family. Nice. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the, the, the data is overwhelming. You know, people want people want and, and, and need purpose in their life. And I love what you said earlier on, you know, purpose finds you. I think there's an element of that. Um, but clearly what you what you did and maybe what other people aren't so good at doing and possibly this is just due to not being ready or that lack of self-awareness or, or um, limited consciousness is to actually see that that is purpose calling you. Um, there's, there's a really cool, I, I did a, a purpose workshop for a group uh, the other night, so it's kind of really fresh in my memory, but the, the word vocation, you know, you could argue that you have a vocation, you know, this is your, um, this is your, this is your thing. Well, vocation comes from the Latin word vocali, which means calling. And so, you know, you were called to come and do this. And th there's a really, um, Carl Jung, uh, sort of psychothe early psychotherapist, he had a really great phrase, um, you know, curiosity is the potential future, the potential best future version of yourself calling yourself towards itself. So that the fact that this kind of opportunity passed in front of your eyes and you were like, I think this could be the thing. It's, I, I, it's, it's like that movie sliding doors um you know yeah. is it called <laughs> Paltrow, it's like there's all these opportunities that that you know your potential best future version of you is, is offering you and, and it's actually recognizing it and having the courage and the desire and and the the, the foresight to go this actually yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a go so it's, i think that that innovation that risk taking has clearly been part of what you've done and it's clearly taken you to some pretty cool places so um, mm go you very unaccounted i don't see how you lasted so long as an accountant <laughs> i know clearly it was a struggle <laughs> <laughs> um so have you thought about taking um you know past tonga or do you think you are commit like would you go to samoa or rarotonga or Nui or papua new guinea or like there's other you know tropical or um you know communities that, that could maybe do with similar inspiration economic development opportunity um or, or do you just think you're just so committed to to tonga with the with the backstory and obviously the name um or could there be possibly uh, like a, a splinter company or yeah any any thoughts around that or you know, it's definitely been in our in our thoughts. Uh, Tonga will always remain like our heart and our home mm. and our you know foundation, our heritage. Um, but for those other countries, it's really about finding partners. 
Mm. Um, so we do get, you know, approaches often. Then when people realize actually vanilla is <laughs> a really long-term investment, it's very high risk, uh, subject to, you know, huge climatic fluctuations and things. Um, and then you kind of spend some time with them and then you never hear from them again. <laughs> um so we're fortunate that we do have supply chain partners in uh, both Uganda and Madagascar that we have visited and we know, um, you know, their supply chain and what they stand for, similar values, similar founding story. So um, we can balance and de-risk our supply chain from Tonga when we need to um, with those supply chain partners. So... Um, yeah, it'd be great to take it, you know, like extend it to a South Pacific vanilla, but it really relies, you know, we're a small team and yeah. we can only be in so many places. So totally. if somebody comes to us and that, you know, they've got the same sort of values and mindset to set it up somewhere, you know, and have the connections and everything, then absolutely. Because um, I think a lot of, People probably looking from the outside think, oh, that's that looks great. Oh, we'll grow some vanilla and we'll sell it. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll do a hey la la from somewhere else. But they don't really realize, you know, what goes into it right from the growing to the manufacturing to the quality to the, yep. you know, production to the marketing, the sales, the distribution, the food safety and quality. You know, it's just like mm. it's a... Yeah, it's a big thing. <laughs> but I mean, also just that depth of connection that, that your dad had that, that you've got, you know. Mm. Um, it, again, it's, it's just to me, it's testament of, and proof of the the authenticity behind what you're doing because, uh, like you say, pl plenty of other Westerners might think, oh, yeah, we can go and, you know, we can go and do that. But it ain't so easy. But And I think that's it's a phrase that I use so often, you know, if doing good was easy, they'd all be doing it. But it, it's mm -hmm. not easy. Like to, to set up what you've set up, it's not for the faint hearted, um, which is no. why there's not many, you know, companies. You know, we're still at 0.01% of the global business population as a certified B Corp. That's why that's why there's not 50 other South Pacific vanilla companies copying what you're doing, because <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah. There's um, an, an Australian did come and try and set up in Tonga uh, about 10 years ago. But, yeah, they lasted a few years and then, yeah, they... Oh, yeah. yeah, I think I think again, it's just um, again with this purpose workshop in in my head, you know, per, that the sense of purpose and connection and the meaning to what you're doing gives increased motivation and resilience, and that the depth of connection that you and your family clearly have to the to the, the purpose and the meaning and the contribution that you're making, it it sees you through the tough times. Whereas if you're fly by night mm -hmm. Johnny, who's hey, I think this is a quick buck. As soon as it gets tough, you're uh, yeah, yeah. I'm out of here. I'm going to try the next thing. I'm going to the next exactly. rich cook scheme. <laughs> There's so, been plenty of times where it's like, what are you doing again? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then people that we meet in Tonga, you know, like in government or in the royal family, they're just like, oh, thank you so much for sticking with it and sticking through <laughs> the tough times. <laughs> Like yeah, they're like I don't think there's been any any business that's stuck in Tonga for over twenty years. Well, so <laughs> the the big question then is, do you support the All Blacks or Tonga when it comes to uh, to rugby or, or other sport? <laughs> well, <laughs> or, both. You're not, not allowed to say. <laughs> both typically, like in the World Cup, I was like, yeah, <laughs> a um, dollar each way. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, the the All Blacks are at a different level, so um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah, look, looking into the future, I guess as as we wrap up, um, what do you think the future looks like for for B Corp um, as a as a movement? Uh, well, I ho I would hope that it becomes larger and more vibrant and has more visibility around the the globe and becomes like a real movement for for doing good. Um, as we you know, there's so many challenges out there and uh, and yeah, that B Corp can play a real role that that whole movement and the community just gets stronger mm. it's it's definitely going that way that's for sure uh no small thanks to awesome companies like yours getting onto the movement um and what's what's the future hold for hey lala any any you're obviously winning you're tripping over awards and, and innovation so what's the um 
what's the next um well, actually, i feel maybe, maybe actually we should dig in a little bit to the zero waste thing because i think people will be interested in that so the, the zero waste production how, how did you get into that um again it was a massy project when we were looking at our um I think we've done about 10 projects with Massey University in the food technology area. Um, one of the projects was around our extraction process, which, again, is part of our B Corp, and we didn't even realise we were doing it. So it's cold extraction as opposed to big industrial vanilla companies. They do heat extraction. Uh, so it's really low energy. Um, so we were doing a project on looking at our extraction process, making sure that we were extracting every possible flavor compound that we could out of the vanilla and we also discovered during that time when we were looking at all the different compounds that there was a bioactive compound for skincare anti-aging um, so then we went and did another project um, and looked at, into that that took about eight years um, and so the the patented process is um, obviously the extraction of vanilla for vanilla extract the extraction of seeds um and then we do a powder and then we also have a bioactive um for skincare so without you know sharing too many details the total package of that means that we have zero waste um whereas most big industrial vanilla companies they're extracting vanilla and then they're left with you know this mush after the end of the extraction process which is a waste pro product. Um, so we're now actually in the position where we can buy waste product from other vanilla company um, and use that in our process. So, um, yeah, that's doing some good for the planet. <laughs> nice. um, yeah, so we're incredibly proud of that process. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just felt, again, it just felt like you, you've really got, got everything pretty well sorted across the key areas of your business but it's great to know that even those doing really well you you want to do even more good um, mm -hmm. and, and i think that's again part of the community part of the movement part of the assessment tool is you know that um uh, the first boss that i had when i moved to new zealand john meek i think i've given him a shout out this might be the second time i've given him a shout out he had a great phrase he said he said you need to have a constructive discontent you, you just need to be discontent with the status quo, but constructively attack it. So don't, you know, why, you know, not be sort of negative. Well, this is terrible. I can't work this. Okay. Mm. This could be better. Why, why is it better? not better? And yeah. how can we do it better? Mm. And that's, mm. that's a real mindset that I think I've kind of just always had, but he, he was the one who kind of gave me that lightning rod to go, this, this is actually what it, what it is. And this is how you can approach it. Um, and I think, yeah, when you, when you apply that with an impact lens, um, yeah, you, you're a pretty, uh, mm. force. just just on the bioactive a little shout out to trilogy cosmetics so they're a new zealand yep. based um skincare uh so we yeah we've supplied them the bioactive so there's a the number of products i've reached recently and that says on front of pack with vanilla active too which is the bioactive um ingredient nice. process. great to see see collabs and hopefully mm. have you have you got any collabs going with any any b corps currently in terms of products? um Oh, there's a few that we're talking to in the states. Um, oh, ta oh, we've done you know some like marketing collabs in terms mm. of um, you know like Taylor Pass Honey, I think, in right. New Zealand. Um, mm, I should have checked that one with our marketing team. But that's yeah. right. That was a last minute throwing <laughs> question by me, so we'll let you off. Um, but yeah, I, I, I will. I've just realized actually. So I, I went to uni with a guy, Tom James. I don't think he's listening. He used to work for Jamie Oliver um, in one of his restaurants. Um, so I will reach out to him and see if we can oh, make that absolutely. connection. Yeah. But be if Tom Tom can't, um, I'm sure the internet will. There's got to be someone listening to this <laughs> who knows someone who knows someone. You know, it's the sixth. I mean, in New Zealand, we call it the two degrees of separation. So, so there has to be someone in New Zealand. Who knows Jamie Oliver or someone in his in his team well enough <laughs> to make the intro if Tom can't? So um, yeah, fingers crossed for that. Um, yeah, just uh, I, I'm reinvigorated through doing this podcast uh, this last few months because we've just had some really not that I'm saying the people who we interviewed earlier on in the year weren't so cool, but we've just had some just some really really awesome companies um, and just hearing the the real backstory because you know we we get a little bit of time when we when we work with you to understand you know kind of what you do, but it's hard to get the full story when 
you know, we're trying to help you smash out your B Corp as quickly as possible. <laughs> and you're busy and all the rest of it. So yeah, thanks so much for making the time. Hopefully, you know, someone listens to this and, and they want to buy some of your vanilla um, or have a collab or, or something. Um, or hopefully they've been inspired to go, hey, actually, you know, maybe we've got a product that we could be sourcing from, you know, uh, somewhere like Tonga or South Pacific or, and we could do it in a really cool way like you have. Mm. So mm. yeah, thank you for everything that that you're doing keep up your amazing work it's um inspirational thank you yeah and it's been great chatting and and likewise re- a bit of re-energizing um yeah when you share your story with other people excellent cool all right we'll, we'll leave you to it thanks tim <laughs> see ya hey it's tim here that b corp bloke from grow good if you want more content on purpose b corp how to do more good in the world as an individual or a business, then you know the drill. Hit the like and subscribe. Check out some of our other videos. They're probably floating around here somewhere. You know how it works. Thank you so much. See you next time.